I have been asked, so let me just answer your question. Well, that sounds great. Not me, the mic. Let me just ask, or let me just tell you, yes, we caught fish. And yes, we had a good time, so we're done with that. How's that sound? I am so delighted how things came, went off last week. Dr. Horn has shared with me, y'all are a wonderful bunch of people. I already knew that. But you listened intently to what he said, and, and uh, you gave him some words of affirmation as well. Way to go. I want to thank Stephen Dix for preaching for me Sunday night. I sure appreciate him uh, being willing to do that and step in. I understand he shared with you some of the testimony of his life. And I have heard that, and I'm sure you were blessed through that testimony. It is good to be back. I want to thank Chuck and Leanne and the, the orchestra and all the folks that just stood in and did what needed to take place. It's always good when the pastor goes away and there's no Greek tragedies that take place while he's gone. Thank you for nobody dying during this last time, this last Sunday. I appreciate that. So in the process of it, though, I want to take you back to where we've been in Hebrews chapter 5. We're going to look at verse 7. This will be the passage that we're dealing with. I want to remind you before you're turning there, we're going to put it up on the screen in a minute, but here's the thing. I don't want to stop hearing the pages doing this. Okay? Because if they do, I'll stop putting it up there. I want you to see it in your Bible to be able to mark it. But if you don't have a Bible with you, we've got it up on the screen. And we want you to use it. But I would prefer always, always, always that you be in God's Word in this. More than just something on a screen. So I encourage you in that. Let me share with you in these last weeks we've talked about we are in Christ. That is where our identity is. You may be saying, well, Jack, you've already said that. That's right, but I'm not going back and reading uh, the passage about Jesus, reading from Isaiah. I'm not doing that because you should know that by now. Have it memorized backwards and forwards and everything else. Can everybody say amen? amen. Jesus knew who he was. He wants us to know who we are in him. We've been looking at it from the perspective of encouragement. We've looked at it from the perspective of uh, forgiveness. We've looked at it in prayer. And this is my final message on prayer. The reason I want to share this with you is because we have talked in the last many weeks about how God has answered all the prayers. We talked about Moses. We talked about Joshua. We talked about Elijah last week. We are two weeks ago. I left off with Elijah and how he called fire down from heaven and consumed all of the water, the altar, the sacrifice, everything on Mount Carmel that day. But there's one thing that we haven't addressed. And in just a moment after we read our passage, I will share that with you. But as we read this passage, I want you to know, did Jesus have to pray? He was God. In fact, several times in Scripture, and we'll look at one of them today, He said, I'm not doing this for my sake. I'm not doing this because I need this. I'm doing this so all can see and understand that I have a relationship with you in prayer. In fact, he wanted to teach his disciples how to pray. They came to him and said, teach us to pray. And he didn't say, oh, no, 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 you don't need to worry about that. God just knows everything. He knows your heart. You don't have... Jesus sat down and he taught them how to pray. He gave them the model prayer. When we look at this, it was because of his piety. It was because he knew who he was and he humbled himself. Even as we should, he humbled himself before a holy and righteous God. He was that holy and righteous God. I know that's sometimes hard to get your uh, imagination around it, but while he was here in the flesh, he was just as much human as you are. Tempted in the same way you are. Blessed in the same way you are. He got hungry just like you did. That's why Satan tempted him in the wilderness. Everything that we go through, he went through. Not just so he could do it as an act, but he did it. He had tears for when they wouldn't believe. He prayed for them. As we see in John 17 in his high priestly prayer. So we know that his prayer life was real and authentic. And I think today as we look at this, we can say, I'll pray for those big things like you asked me to in these last few weeks. I'll pray that God will take me to great places and do great things. And, and, and I want to see his glory. And, and we pray for those things. But here's the thing. Jesus gives us the example. And as we read this, I want you to see it was because of his piety. It wasn't because he was showing off. It wasn't because he wanted some from God. He already knew God well enough to know what he wanted. Because he was God. So as we stand to read this passage in Hebrews chapter 5 verse 7, I want to remind you of these things. Please stand with me. Hebrews chapter 5 verse 7. 
In the days of his flesh, speaking of Jesus, he offered up both prayers and supplication with loud crying and tears to the one able to save him from death. And he was heard because of his piety. Father, we come before you and as we continue to explore prayer and understand greater things, I pray, Father, that you would help us to see the, 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 the meaning of all of this today. Help us to understand even better today about prayer. Father, I pray that you would use me, hide me behind your cross, that your Holy Spirit may be able to speak through me, in me, as you. And I pray, Father, all these things in the precious name of Jesus. Amen. Thank you. You may be seated. We talked about God answering prayer. But what about when heaven is silent? It's awesome when we hear, in fact, uh, oftentimes in our prayer time we say, Oh, I've got to praise. God answered prayer. And everybody's eager to hear how God answered prayer. But what about when he's silent? When we hear that God has answered prayer, it motivates us and reminds us to be more diligent about praying, doesn't it? When we hear somebody else's prayer request answered, we're like, oh, I better be praying too. Why don't I join them in that? So, we pray. We're specific, we're confident, we're bold, just as the scripture tells us to be. We're absolutely convinced God will answer. But what happens when in your prayer, heaven seems to be silent? I know that probably everybody in this room has somewhere in their life experienced that. And you may have swept it under the rug and just left it alone. Or you may have let it become something that was a stumbling block to you later. Many of you probably seen the uh, movie Santa Claus with Tim Allen. If you remember, Santa Claus is up on the roof and, and somehow he falls off the roof because of something Tim Allen did. And he dies. And so Tim Allen has to become Santa Claus. Well, you know, I understand it. And you're saying, what are you preaching about Santa Claus for? I get you. It's an illustration, folks. Work with me here just a little bit. Okay? So he becomes Santa Claus, but his ex-wife and her husband do not believe in Santa Claus. They don't believe in Santa Claus. But it's interesting to note why they don't believe in Santa Claus. They stopped believing in Santa Claus because they didn't get what they asked from him. They stopped believing. I think he wanted a weenie whistle or something like that, and she wanted this particular doll. And so they stopped believing in Santa Claus altogether just because they didn't get what they asked for. I'll share you, uh, with you an even more poignant story. This is a real-life individual. If I were to say the Atlantic Braves, the Atlanta Hawks, CNN, TNT, Cartoon Network, Time Warner Incorporated, and the Captain Planet Foundation, who would you think of? That's right. Ted Turner. The television mogul. It's interesting because as you think about that and, and everything, you need to understand that he is probably one of the biggest critics of Christianity. Do you know why? According to Cliff Vaughn, who had an interview with him, and he uh, writes for the Ethics Daily in February 2003, uh, columns on culture and media, Ted Turner says, I've been saved so many times. Speaking of his Christianity, I've been saved so many times. I lost my religious beliefs, he says, when my sister got lupus, Turner said candidly. She was 12 and she died at 17 and I was 15 when she got it. She was ill. It ruined her mind. She became insane. He goes on to further speak about the fact that they had to pad their house because she had lost so much capacity. She still was able to move about but she had, couldn't keep her balance and all of the things that go along with it and, and they had to pad their house and she would bump into walls and she would cry out to God and say, God, please, please heal me. But there was a time in his life he didn't get. He said he prayed for her and prayed for her and prayed for her and it never came. She died. 
And because of that, he has kind of a a tongue-in-cheek attitude toward Christianity. In fact, in the interview, he taunts several times, even in the end, as he leaves. God's will be done. And everyone laughed because they knew it wasn't a statement of faith, but a statement of disbelief. It's interesting because God does say no. And there's times when we're not praying for the things of God, we're praying for the things we want. As in the movie, as in the life of Ted Turner. By the way, I pray for him all the time. I pray for him because I understand that there's many just like him in churches today who are expecting God to deliver when they pray. And I have to tell you, that's not our God. Our God is sovereign. He answers and He loves you. But sometimes the answer is no. No matter how spiritual you may be, there's going to be times that God says no to your prayers. It doesn't matter how much you have sacrificed or endured for the cause of Christ. If you don't believe that, ask Paul. There's going to be times that God says, no, I'm not going to give you that. No, I'm not going to answer that request. We want Him to, and for the last three weeks that we've talked, I've talked about how God answered prayer and did great things for people who are following, but sometimes people get in their mind, if I do a bunch of things for God, then He'll answer my prayers. And it's a contract instead of a covenant between Him. You didn't deliver, therefore I don't have to deliver anymore. I'm mad at you because I think you're mad at me. And you see how that is not what prayer is about. Prayer is not about me offering up my demands or my thoughts or or anything else. It's about me recognizing He's a sovereign God and He's going to do what He chooses to do. And He loves me. And oftentimes those prayer requests that I don't have answered, later I thank God that He didn't answer them. When we think of Paul... Paul asked to be delivered from the thorn in his flesh. Don't know exactly what that was, but he asked three times and he said, but your grace is sufficient, it'll carry me through. He reminds us, though, of some things and we think, oh no, you know, I'm sure that he prayed during the time he was shipwrecked. He prayed during the time of all of the things taking place. It says he was singing songs and, and worshiping the Lord when he was in prison in Philippi. But he writes in 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verses 23 through 27. They are servants of Christ. I speak as if I'm insane. I'm more so in far more labors, in far more imprisonments, beaten times without number, often in danger of death. Five times I received from the Jews 39 lashes. Three times I was beaten with rods, once I was stoned. Three times I was shipwrecked. Wow. Wow. A night and a day I spent in the deep. I have been on frequent journeys in danger from rivers, dangers from robbers, dangers from my countrymen, dangers from the Gentiles, danger in the city, danger in the wilderness, dangers on the sea, dangers among false brethren. I have been in labor and hardship through many sleepless nights, in hunger and thirst, often without food, in cold and exposure. God, I I, I want all these things. Paul is saying here, do you not believe that Paul was praying during all of this? I would be, wouldn't you? But yet he says, wait a minute. There's nothing greater than serving you. And if God needs us to be beaten, if He needs us to be undergo hardship, if He needs us to go through times where we just have to trust Him, sometimes that can be very difficult. There will be times that it feels like God has turned a deaf ear to your request. Again, Paul is an example of one who accomplished a great deal for God. He had started churches. The greater part of the New Testament is written by Paul. And he trained pastors and he sent out missionaries. But even for him, there were times that heaven seemed to be silent. If it happened to him, don't you think it's going to happen to you? The Bible's not there just so we can deify or or elevate the people of the Bible. They're sharing with us some of the real life experiences that they've had. And in the process of it, they're telling us that the answer was God. 
as they lifted it up in prayer, as God showed them the way all through this, we know that God was answering. It may not have been the way Paul wanted. It may not be the way you want. But God was answering. The only reason that I would say that heaven is silent is because you don't know enough about God. You don't know enough about Him. And I'm going to share with you a statement that's not mine originally, but when I read it, I said, you know, I've got to share this with you this morning. God laid it on my heart. How are you going to respond when it happens to you in your life? How are you going to make it through? Many of you are sitting on the edge of your seat going, Tell us, preacher! Well, let me tell you who I got it from first, so I'm not misquoting it. It comes from a sermon that uh, Chris Talton shared. He says this, When God doesn't seem to be saying anything, rest your confidence on what God has already said. Powerful, isn't it? Well, you don't know. And it seems like heaven is silent. Are you paying attention to what He's already said? Or do you abandon that so quickly? Do you run from that and, and you get mad at God? God, why didn't you answer me? He's already answered us in so many other ways. How could we even for a moment doubt Him? How could we say that He's not a good God when He's shown us so many times that He is? When we say, you didn't answer my request that I'm for, I'm going to be mad at you. Wait a minute. If you would be mad at the one who sent His Son to die at Calvary so that you could be restored back to Him and without Him you would spend eternity in a place of torment? Really? Would you be angry at a God for that? You see, it's important for us to get this picture. It's important for us to understand when God doesn't seem to be saying anything, rest your confidence in what God has already said. Has He said enough? From this pastor's heart, I can say, I believe He said everything He needs to say. And that leads me to the next thing. I notice I'm not spending a great deal of time on when God doesn't answer prayer or when you feel like He's far off. I'm not spending a great deal of time there because there's more evidence of what He wants to do than what He hasn't done. In fact, if you were to stack up all the things and say this is what God hasn't done, I, I promise you that the stack of what God has already done is greater by far. Because He's already done it. And He is still doing it. And this last week I've had more people in coming back and even prior to this, even the church that we went to last Sunday morning. It was interesting that one of their staff members there needed a word of affirmation and something was said and I called him this week and I didn't know he needed affirmation. He was trying to start a new program in the church. And there were some difficulties there. And I just said, hey, I want to know a little bit more about this. And, and can you help me understand what dilemmas you may be having? And, and he said, you know, we've been working on this for quite some time. He said, I, I've almost come to a point where I just want to abandon it because we've got an old, a lot of old folks in our church that don't want, to, don't want to change. They want to stay like it is. And I said, wow. I could see how it would be beneficial. I don't know that I'd call it what you've called it, but I could see where the ideology that you have is a wonderful thing and could bring the body of Christ together. He needed a word of affirmation. Dr. Horn last week needed a word of affirmation, and guess what? I already shared with you he received that from some of you. This week some very impressive things have taken place that all I can say is, you go, God where people have come together only by God's design. Only God could do those kind of things. Only God. So we can focus on what God isn't doing, and the reality of it is He's already done everything He needs to do. There's nothing left undone. He doesn't have to show us one more miracle. He doesn't have to do one more thing. And sometimes we think prayer is that one more miracle. God, You answer me. Lord, give me my requests. And if you'll do that, then I'll believe. I have to tell you, if you don't believe before you take that prayer request to Him, shame on you. Because we should have believed Him and not had to ask in our unbelief. Well, there's a song that I just love the, the lyric to. And I don't know if you've ever really paid any attention to it. It's called the solid rock. When darkness seems to hide his face, I rest on his unchanging grace. 
In every high and stormy gale, my anchor holds within the veil. His oath, His covenant, His blood support me in the whelming flood. When all around my soul gives way, He then is all my hope and stay. On Christ the solid rock I stand. All other ground is sinking sand. First of all, let me conclude this part of the message. Are you paying attention to what God has already promised you? Are you paying attention to what He's already done? What more could you ask of Him? And how foolish would it be to ask you, ask Him those things, knowing what He's already done? Now before you say, well, you're saying just don't pray? Absolutely not. It's important to pray. But most of the time we get mad at God because He didn't do what we wanted Him to do. I'm going to share with you now a positive thought on all of this. Let me share with you some of the things that God says we should be praying for. And I promise you, because God's Word is true, that everything that you pray for that I'm about to share with you, He will give you an answer. If you don't like not getting an answer, quit asking things for yourself. If you want to start asking and seeing how prayer works for those who are diligent and understand what it is we're to be praying for, let's take a look. The first thing that I would say is pray for God's will to be done. Above all else, you say, Lord, I'd like this and I'd like that and everything, but Lord, your will be done. And be willing to submit to whatever His will is. If he gives it, praise God. If he doesn't, praise God. Either way, he gets the praise. God loves it when his people praise him. So the first thing we should pray for is for God's will to be done. Our example is Jesus Christ in the agony shortly before he was crucified. In the garden, he agonized over this. But in each of his requests, in each of his prayers, three times, he still said, not my will, but yours be done. The second thing you can pray for and be assured that God will answer, pray that God would use you each day to His glory. God, use me this day to Your glory. Let this day not be about me or what I get or all the things I do, but let it be what You do in me. How You work in my life and how You work with other people and how I can bring glory to Your name. One of the passages I shared with you in these last several weeks is John chapter 12, verses 27 through 28. Now my soul has become troubled, and what shall I say? Father, save me from this hour. But for this purpose I came to this hour. Father, glorify your name. Glorify your name. Then a voice came out of heaven. I have both glorified it and will glorify it again. You see, Jesus was about glorifying the Father. Father, may your glory be seen in me. Do we pray that? Do we live that? Father, let your glory be seen in me this day. Let me show people what it looks like to, be, to belong to you. It's interesting because Jesus already knew this. Because if you look in verse 30 of that same chapter, John chapter 12, you'll see a very interesting thing. Jesus answered and said, This voice has not come for my sake but for yours. You see the confidence that he had that I'm talking about? The confidence is knowing that I didn't have to say these things because I was worried about the Father not getting it. I already knew he was going to get the glory. I said it so that you could hear it. I spoke it because it was the truth and I already knew it. Christians, I don't know why we walk around and we act as if we don't know anything. We act as if God isn't on his throne. We act as if all the problems of society and all the ills of our world and everything like that, there's just no hope. I have to tell you, of all people, we ought to be dispensers of hope because we know Him. So, pray for God's will to be done. Pray that God would use you each day to His glory. Pray for His peace to be upon you. I never really fully understood that until just a few years ago. You know when bad things are happening and you get angry, agitated? Anybody been there? Come on, give me a testimony. Yeah, okay. We've all been there. Get frustrated and mad. Do we run to peace or do we run to 
angst, anxiety, and conflict. Yes. <laughs> why, are we, why are we living in His peace? Why are we saying, Lord, even in the midst of this controversy, in the midst of this turmoil, let there be peace? Nehemiah did it when he stood before the king, knowing that the next words that came out of his mouth could cost him his life. He prayed and asked God to give him the words to say. And he spoke. And the king honored Nehemiah. It's a wonderful story if you read the book of Nehemiah, the first three chapters. Actually, the first two chapters, you'll find that story there. What a glorious thing God did. When we look for His peace, Philippians chapter 4, verses 6 and 7. Philippians chapter 4, verse 6 and 7 ought to be something that all of us have in our hearts and our minds. Be anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, give your request, let your request be made known to God. And the peace of God which surpasses all comprehension will guard your hearts and your mind in Christ Jesus. Wow. That ought to be just a mainstay for Christians. Wow. Ask for His peace. It doesn't have to be just a conflict at work. It can be peace in your home. And if you've got kids, peace in the home would be awesome, wouldn't it? As long as you try and accomplish it on your own, it won't come. Peace in the church won't come unless that's what we seek from God. We have to seek Him in these things. And so often it's because we want to keep all of our little petty things. We don't seek the peace of God. And it's there for us to help us overcome. And to be able to see things clearly. Isn't it interesting when you stop for just a minute and say, Lord, let your peace just come over me. Let me see things like I've never seen them before. Open my eyes. I want to see what you would have me to do. And you know what? So often we're so quick to open our mouth, aren't we? Nobody's like that in here, right? Conflict comes, we keep our mouth shut. Yeah, we just, well, I'm not going to say anything. Wisdom dictates I shouldn't say anything, so I'm not going to say anything. I don't know how many times the Spirit convicts me and I'll say something to somebody and it's like, I told you not to say that. I know. But it just seems so good. It was a tasty morsel, Lord. And usually I wind up with indigestion over it. Anybody there? Yeah. You'd be surprised. A lot of times when that little voice in your head says, don't do it. Especially if you're a Christian. I can almost, I can almost tell you that if it's a still small voice, that's God. That's His Spirit saying, don't do that. And then Satan comes in right after it because after you've done it, he says, ha, you did it. And now you feel guilty, don't you? See how these things just play in our minds so quickly? Best thing to do is listen to Him first. Seek His peace. And the peace of God will surpass all comprehension. In fact, His peace is so great that you can't even understand it. I've had people in hospitals who have, have, have great anxiety about very serious surgeries and, and, and we pray for them. And it, whether it's a deacon or it's me or anybody else, we just pray for them and, and take a moment to stop worrying about all that the doctor is saying, stop worrying about all that's been said, all the difficulties, all the scary things, like that paper they make you sign that says, you could die while we take this ingrown toenail out. <laughs> and it just kind of wipes it all away. And I've heard them give testimony after the surgery and even sometimes before they go in, just it seems like there's a calmness that comes over them. The rest of the world is just like, oh my goodness, they're scared and they're frightful and they're fearful of what's going to take place. But the peace that God can give, it's peace that passes all comprehension. And I promise you, if you're struggling and there's no peace in your life, you're not asking the one who provides peace. Because He will and it will be beyond what you can comprehend. Well, the second thing we can pray for, the fourth thing we can pray for is His wisdom. I promise you when he, you pray for His wisdom, if you're seeking His face, He will answer you about that. He will. All of these that I'm sharing with you, He says He will. In fact, in James chapter 1, we see verses 5 through 8. James chapter 1, verses 5 through 8. It says... But if any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask of God who gives to all generously without reproach and it will be given to him. 
but he must ask in faith without doubting. For the one who doubts is like the surf of the sea driven and tossed by the wind. For that man ought not to expect that he will receive anything from the Lord, being a double-minded man, unstable in all his ways. Lord, give me wisdom so that I can cheat my partner and get, get more money so I can give it to you. Now, Lord, give me wisdom so that I can hide the affair that I'm having with this man or this woman. Give me wisdom on how to hide that from my husband. Those are requests that God isn't going to answer. God, give me wisdom. I've told this lie and I don't want to have to fix it. Give me wisdom to know how not to do that. Lord, give me wisdom to know what you would have me do today. Lord, give me wisdom so that I can speak to my brothers and sisters in a way that's reconciling, in a way that edifies not only them but the church. Give me wisdom so that I can speak to those who are hurting and not water down the truth of the gospel. Give me wisdom so that when I'm confronted with those issues at school where students come and they ridicule me or they want to know an answer from you, not because they want to know but so that they can make fun Give me wisdom to know how to respond so that, Lord, you can be glorified. Give me wisdom. <laughs> He'll answer that one. What about your strength? Most of us think, and we're very proud. Pride keeps us from asking for God's wisdom. Pride also causes us to do an awful lot of things in our own strength. I still wrestle with that. But his strength, I love what is said and spoken over in Isaiah chapter 40. When he's speaking to his people in Isaiah 40 about their strength. Isaiah 40 verses 28 and 29. Isaiah 40, 28 and 29. Do you not know? Have you not heard? The everlasting God, the Lord, the creator of the ends of the earth, does not become weary or tired. His understanding is inscrutable. He gives strength to the weary, and to him who lacks might, he increases power. You know, this is the problem that we have. Oh, I can do this all in my own strength. And it says right here, and he goes in and says, but you didn't do that. If you continue reading, they didn't do that. And all the things that God had promised, they, they fell by the wayside because the people chose not to follow. I'm just curious, when I read this passage and I understand it, His strength, we, we act when we pray as if, if we mingle a little bit of our strength and we add a little bit of God's strength in there, that guess what? We're all okay. It's not about your strength at all. It's about surrendering who you are in your strength, in your intelligence, and in all of those things to say, I'm going to follow you. I'm going to commit myself to this because I know where my strength, my wisdom, my peace, I know where it comes from. You see how this all fits into our identity, who we are? You see, if I could say anything about prayer, I would say encouragement is pretty much self-explanatory. Forgiveness is pretty much self-explanatory. Although there's many passages that we looked at, but when it comes to prayer, prayer is a confidence that we can have that God keeps His Word. That God is God, and we're not. He gives us peace. He gives us strength. He gives us wisdom. If we'll ask. If we'll ask. How many of you, knowing that all you had to do was just ask somebody, but you determined in your heart and in your mind, I am not doing that. I am not going to humble myself before them. I'm going to just keep doing what I've always done. Anybody out there like that? Me too. I don't want to ask for forgiveness. I don't want to ask for things that, that, that uh, might bring healing and restoration. I don't want to ask for those things, Pastor. I have no desire to do that. I, I, don't, I want to be angry. I want to be mad. But when I look at this, He tells us that He will give us strength. And if we do it, it increases our strength because our dependence is no longer on us, it's on Him. And when you say, I can't do something, like mend fences, fix things. When you say you can't, I promise you that God will give you the strength to do that. 
to say, let's get this right. But the question is, are we willing to allow Him to do that? One more thing. There are several. I'm going to give them to you very quickly after this. But His guidance. His guidance. Isaiah 48. Just a few chapters after Isaiah 40. Isaiah 48, 17. If we pray for His guidance, I guarantee you He will give it if we're willing to follow it. So often we say, Lord, I pray for Your guidance. Now here's what I'm going to do today. How does that work with Your plan? Can you fit your stuff in there, God? I've got my agenda already. The guidance that we uh, get every day from Him is to say, Lord, I'm going to take each moment of this day and I'm going to live it to Your glory, but I need Your guidance through this day. You see how all these things are important to us? So we pray for guidance in Isaiah 48, 17. Thus says the Lord, your Redeemer. This is from Him. Thus says the Lord, your Redeemer, the Holy One of Israel. I am the Lord your God who teaches you to profit, who leads you in the way you should go. Wow. He's already said that. All of these things that I'm sharing with you, He's already said these things. It's right there in God's Word saying, I've already said this. You're praying for guidance? I have to tell you, I could go through a whole lot more, but we've already talked about praying for His encouragement. We've talked about praying for His forgiveness. We've talked about praying for His provision. We've talked about praying for His patience. Notice I didn't say our patience. Because our patience is about that big. Can I get an amen? Amen. Brother Jack, you're being awful mean this morning. No, I'm not. I'm just being real. Our patience is little, but his patience is great. You know how I know his patience is great? He's been patient with me. And you. And if he can be patient with me, i got some things to learn about patience. I'll not pray for it because I believe that God will measure that out and meter that out to me all through my life. But I'm learning more and more about it, aren't you? Well, here's some other things you can pray for that I promise He will answer. All of these things I've shared with you so far, the Bible tells us He will answer. Let's go on. Pray for people to be saved. Pray for people to be saved. Tomorrow night we've got a big event going on and I hope and pray that it's not just about figuring out your game or figuring out how much candy we have or how much we're going to give out or where everything's going to be set up or anything else. I hope that our main focus tomorrow night is that people would be saved. That we would have the opportunity to share with them. I shared this over in the the other service just a few moments ago. I shared with them the importance of it. This isn't about celebrating Halloween. It's not about the kids going away with lots of candy. It's about people going away with Jesus Christ. That's what it's about. I know that you want to be a part of that. There's sign-up sheets out there for whatever you'd like to do. But if nothing else, if you want to just come, I have a whole stack of tracks that I'd, be, I'd love to share with you how to use them. And you probably already know how, but I'd love to share with you how to use them. And I hope that you'd come tomorrow and get rid of all the tracks that I have. Not just so we can hand them a piece of paper, but so that we can stop and spend some time with these families that will be here. Well, pray for people to be saved. Pray for your wife or your husband. What? Pray for your wife or your husband. You know, God answers those prayers. He answers them. You may be saying it's been long in coming, but I tell you what, He answers them. Pray for them. Lift them up before the Father. Not be so much about, Lord, did you see all the bad things my wife did to me the other day? Lord, get her! Maybe I should turn it around. Lord, you see all those things my husband did to me the other day? Get her! You see, I just, wanted to go, I just wanted to be able to say that both ways. The reality of it is, though, God will hear you when you pray for your spouse. Pray that they would grow in the Lord. Pray that they would seek His face. Of all people, they're partnered together with you. Of course, you want to be carrying on the same kind of life that they carry on, and that life should lead to the glory of God. See how that works? Do it together. Our world is really confused about what it means to be married. Do it together and let them see a husband and a wife that are praying for one another and loving one another. Let them see the things that God has established and they'll realize, I miss that. I want that. And the only way that we know that that's possible is through Christ. Pray for your future spouse. You know, I, there's a lot of youth who come and say, Oh, Brother Jack, I'm in love with this person or in love with that person. I'd almost say you're in lust with them.
You met them and you, you just said, hey, they talked to me, they spoke to me, and now I'm in love with them. You have some kind of ideology that says, I, I'm out there and I'm searching, and, and you've been rejected so many times that, my goodness, the first person who comes along and says, oh, you're pretty, or hey, I think you're smart. Man, we want to fall in love and just, oh, wow, I'll tell you what, here's the best thing that you could ever do. Pray that God would bring your spouse to you, but until then, Lord, I am going to serve you with all of my heart and wait on you. I'm so tired of hearing about people who get involved and things happen in the relationship and they just knew that it was God's will. And you know what? It's, it, God's will doesn't have that much tears and that much trouble with it. That ain't God's will. That was your choice. God says, I've already made that choice. In 1 Corinthians chapter 7, it talks about, hey, if you burn with passion, get married. But here's the thing. Christian, you ought to be asking God, who do you want me to marry? Pray for who's going to be your spouse and don't be so anxious about figuring it out for yourself. God will bring them to you. Hmm. Wow. If you don't believe that, read the story of Ruth. Beautiful story. God will fix that. Well, pray for your kids. Pray for your kids. That doesn't mean they're going to be perfect, but God hears the prayer. And I guarantee you, sometimes when you pray and say, God, do whatever you have to do to get their attention, sometimes He may take your life. But I guarantee you, He will get their attention. Train them up in the way they should go. And when they're old, on, not depart from it. Be willing to be a servant of God and say, Lord, I'm praying for my kids and I want them to love you. Whatever it takes. Well... You can pray for your church and your church family. Look at the person next to them and say, I'm going to pray for you this week. Now, some of y'all said it like, I'm going to pray for you next week. I heard that. Now, now listen. Wouldn't it be great if all of us walked out of this place knowing that we were praying for each other? And whatever was going to come our way this week, whether they were by my side or not, but they're thinking about me this week and lifting me up before the Father. You see, there's a camaraderie. That's why Christ died for the church. He died for us individually, but He also died so that we could have this fellowship together. Think about it. I'm praying for you. I know you're praying for me. Are you praying for the person sitting next to you? You ought to. God hears that. Pray for your pastor and staff and church leaders. And all God's people said... I covet that more than you know. Pray for me. Pray for our staff. A lot of stuff going on. Sometimes we get caught up in some of this stuff. And our prayer needs to be back on the things of God. Pray for us. Here's one you're not going to like. Pray for your boss and your co-workers. They need Christ. And if they're already Christian, enjoy that with them. Wouldn't that be awesome? Enjoy that with them. Celebrate Christ in your workplace. You say, oh, my boss would say, you know what? I, I got to tell you, our boss is greater than your boss. I'm not saying be disrespectful. I'm not saying don't do your work. I, if you say we're having a Bible study while I'm on the clock and, and our boss got mad and fired us all and we want the church to stand up and fight against him, I'm going to say, you're an idiot. The Bible says give that man or give that person a fair day's labor. Work your day. If you want to have Bible studies, do it on your lunchtime or do it off campus or do it someplace. But you, you can still fellowship with the brothers and sisters around you, even though they don't go to Woodlake Baptist Church. I know that's almost heresy. But you could. God will hear that. Pray for our governmental leaders. There are several places in the Bible tell us to do that. Pray for them. I know that the elections are coming up. Oh, my goodness. I got you. I feel your pain. I probably said way too much already. But I would say to you today, you pray about what God would have us do. Pray for all of us. It's not about your candidate or my candidates. It's about praying God's will be done. Well, pray for the people that you're going to meet today. You're going to walk right by them. And as you go by and as they walk by you, be reminded or at least ask yourself this question. Lord, is that person on their way to hell and I walked by them and said nothing Lord help me 
to have the boldness to talk to them. They said hi to me. And I just grunted a hi back at them. Lord, help me with those people I'll meet today. I found this prayer and I, I just want to share it with you. In light of all of this, as I go, be with me, Lord. Be the patience when I'm frustrated. Be the endurance when I'm tired. Be the wisdom when I'm uncertain. Be the inspiration when I'm out of ideas. Be the peacemaker when I feel hurt. Be the comforter when I feel overwhelmed. Be the strength when I'm weary. Be the guide when I'm confused. Be the forgiver when I get it wrong. Be with me, Lord, today. Wow. When we abandon our wants and will in prayer and in our life and embrace merging into what God wants and wills, we will hear from God because we want to see Him. We want to focus on Him. On Ritterman Road, they used to have an entrance ramp onto 35, if you remember that old entrance ramp. And I have to tell you, if you ever took that entrance ramp, you just almost had to take your life into your own hands. Remember it? It was short. It was right on the top of a bridge. And usually those 18-wheelers were flying through there. Well, to merge into that means you become a part of it, but you better be careful how you merge. When I was driving a truck, I used to drive a tractor-trailer 30 years ago in my life. But there was a time in my life after driving a tractor trailer for so long, <laughs> I got to tell you, they're big. And people usually will move out of, uh, out of your way. Maybe not in today's world, but uh, when you start just merging over, people kind of either slam on the brakes or whatever. And sometimes when I'd come to something like that, I'd just pull on and say, better move. You know, sometimes I think that's what we do with God. We want to merge into what he's doing. We say, move over, God. I'm coming in no matter what you say. And God says, okay. It's a good way to get run over. But I've learned something over the years. And right as I, I started riding a motorcycle, it was before they closed that entrance ramp. Now it's way down there by Eisenhower Road. But before they closed it, there were a couple of times that I, I, I went around that curve there at that, that shell station and I started to get up onto 35 on my motorcycle. I have to tell you, I did that with great fear. I did that with great angst. I was like, oh my gosh, please don't let there be a big truck coming. It's going to roll me over. I'm, I'm the smallest thing on the road now. I tell you, it's humbling. And I have to ride instead of it's all about me and I've got a big truck. I have to ride with, oh my goodness, everybody's trying to kill me. That was my advice from my brother. So as I would merge on to that in those days that I would go around to the hospitals and stuff like that because that was the quickest way. And I would merge on to that. I did that with great fear, recognizing that there was a lot at stake when I got on that ramp. Let me tell you something. When it's all about my will, it's about me forcing my way into things of God and it doesn't work. But when it's about His will, I humble myself and recognize I'm not the biggest thing out there. I'm not, and I have to pray and humble myself because I see me as who I really am. Before God, we are His children, and He loves us. It's not a badge we can wear around and say, ha, 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 look at us. It's a badge that we wear with great humility, knowing what He did. It's not about how big we are. It's about how small we are in the presence of a big God. That's what prayer is about. Humbling ourselves. Merging into the things of God, not for my purposes, but for His. As we consider this, some of you in your prayer life, I don't know how, where you are in all of this. I don't know what God may be speaking to your heart about right now. Maybe it's just I need to have a better prayer life. I hope that these, these messages has, have helped you understand that prayer it helps us with the confidence we have because in prayer we can take the things of Scripture and in prayer we can say, God, you can do this. And it gives us a confidence in your identity. Are you confident before the Lord? Not in arrogance. Not in foolishness, not in pride, but are you confident 
with meekness, knowing that God can accomplish all things. Even what we say is impossible, God can do. He can do it. I hope and pray that if there's someone here today that doesn't know the Lord, you may be saying, I'm so far gone that there's no way that God would ever accept me. I've got to tell you something. He's in the business of making the possible out of the impossible. He wants to know you. He wants you to have that relationship we've talked about in prayer. But I would also say to you Christians, to myself, God has a plan for our life. And when we pray the things of God, He'll answer those things. And when He does, to God be the glory. His will has been done. That ought to be so important to us. Would you stand with me?